Hello everyone, welcome to your online lecture for pathologies of the face, ears, and throat. We just finished the eyes, which happened to actually be a part of the, the facial structure, but they really weren't their own um, fully online lecture. So today we're gonna finish off the face and then move into the ears and the throat and talk about the different anatomy and pathologies that occur to each of those anatomical structures. But I really like us to kind of um, take a step back and to really think about the face differently. So first and foremost, uh, one of the things that we have to consider is that any injury to the face, whether that's the nose, the mouth, the eyes, the skull, um, is, is significant. We have to treat it as significant because of the potential relationship to impact neurological function. We know that the skull encases the brain, one of the most vital organs in the body. So for that reason alone, anytime we have a facial injury, we have to do a thorough evaluation of that patient sitting in front of us. Um, the potential for permanent physical deformity and, and disability, um, and in the case of throat injuries, like compromised airway can um, elevate the type of injury, escalate the pathology that we're treating. So any injury to the face, we really want to treat it as significant. So our first stop in this online lecture is going to be the face. Uh, the face is going to be the most anterior region of the head or the skull. Um, and one of the things that I find interesting in preparing for this uh, online lecture is that the recognition that the human face is one of the most unique aspects of an individual, right? Um, even with identical twins, typically if you look at them closely, you, you'll probably see facial differences among the two. Um, the face as a whole contains many anatomical structures that will contrib contribute to the display of emotions, mainly muscles contracting to allow us to smile, to frown, right? Um, feeding or eating, which happens through the mouth, which is attached to the face. Seeing, which obviously we talked about, uh, occurs within the eyes. Smelling will occur through the nose. And then communicating, which happens as a result of muscular contraction and, and the tongue, right? But one of the most distinguishing qualities of the face is that it's used for personal identity from person to person, right? So oftentimes um, when we meet people, the first thing that we do is what? We look them in the face, right? And so it's one of the first things that we use to kind of identify a person. And, and I'm not thinking of like a deceased person, but certainly just to kind of work on like facial recognition, for example. Um, identity is essential since the face is usually the first aspect of the human that is noticeable um, during encounters, right? Again, so that's me saying I'm introducing myself to you. It's the first thing. There are other uh, ways to identify individuals such as fingerprinting, for example, but the face is most often the, the anatomical structure that's going to be used. So again, the face extremely important for many reasons. It creates part of our identity. It protects, it's a part of the skull. And so it's responsible for creating um, or protecting the skull or the brain. And then in addition to that, there are lots of different kind of um, ways in which the face contributes to displaying emotions, feeding, seeing, smelling, and communicating. So if you can't tell by now, the face is a very important structure. And so anytime we have injury to it, you wanna do a thorough evaluation. Okay, moving on to the anatomy of the face and the skull. I think it's important to kind of understand the skull anatomy a little bit more in detail. Your book actually doesn't do a great job of providing a little bit more detail. So I'm going to go probably more in depth than your book would. Um, so first and foremost, uh, the anatomy of the face and skull, we're going to start with the bone first. The, the anatomy of the bone is such that the cranium itself is made up of eight bones. Those eight bones include uh, two temporal bones. So I'll write them here, in here, two temporal, temporal bones, which will be right and left. It will represent two parietal bones, which will be right and left. It will represent one occipital bone. It'll also represent one ethmoid bone. And I'll draw that in here. These are the ethmoid bones. Um, so one eth continual ethmoid bone one frontal bone, and then where's my spinoid? One spinoid bone. So you can see those kind of eight cranial bones before I erase them and then really talk more deeply about them. So 
the two lateral cranial bones are going to be the parietal bone and um, the temporal bone. So this is the parietal bone. As we said, there's two of them. And then we have the temporal bone, which also there's two of them as well, both on the right and left sides. So they're going to be the most lateral. The um, temporal bone is most lateral. And then your parietal bone is going to be lateral posterior. And I'll show you that in a different image on the next slide. But at the base of the skull is the occipital bone. Um, the occipital bone is important because it creates the base of the skull. But then as we look at this image here, one of the things that we see in the red is that the occipital bone is relatively large, right? So it's going to receive a very large portion of the brain and allow that brain to sit there. But this circle right here is the frame and magnum. The frame and magnum is responsible for receiving the spinal cord from the spine and allowing it to move from the spine into the cranial cavity, right? So this is the gateway for the spinal cord to enter into the cranial cavity to insert on the actual brain itself. In the green, what I wanted to highlight for you well, were two different things. This is the temporal bone. So as I said, it's the more lateral of the two between the parietal and the temporal bone. So it's more lateral in anterior in nature. And then you have the very small, do you see it here, lateral posterior parietal bone. And um, this is actually a really great view to see one of the other bones, which is the sphenoid bone. So this is the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone, remember, is going to make up a lot of the eye orbit. And I'll show you that on the other slide. But this is the sphenoid bone. It reminds me of the Batman symbol or, or a butterfly. So hopefully you can envision that a little bit. So I'll go back so that you can actually see the sphenoid bone in all of its, its glory. So we can see it from a lateral perspective here. But where I really love to look at the sphenoid bone is it in its role in the actual eye orbit. It's going to make up, remember, that most posterior portion of the eye orbit um, and create the framework really for the eye to sit and to become extremely stable. So I don't know if you're getting pumped, but hopefully you're tying the eye lecture to the, the facial lecture, right? Okay. Now that we've talked through the temporal bone, the occipital bone, the frontal bone, the parietal bone, the sphenoid bone, one of the other bones that we have to talk about in terms of finalizing the eight bones of the cranium, the last one and very small one is going to be the eth ethmoid bone and that's this bone right here. Um, this bone right here is going to make up the most medial part of the eye orbit. So again, it's going to create a base of support for that eye to actually sit. So we've covered all eight cranial bones. We've covered the two temporal bones. I'm just going to highlight point to those. We've covered the two temporal bones. We've covered the two parietal bones. We've covered the base of the skull and its foramen magnum. So I'll go here, the base of the skull or the occipital bone and its foramen magnum. We've covered the sphenoid bone, which is the Batman bone. And then if we were to back up a little bit, we've also covered the ethmoid bone, which is going to be this medial bone here, which creates the medial portion kind of of the eye orbit. So now that we've covered all eight cranial bones, let's talk about some of the supporting um, role bones that we, we should discuss. So the first bone that we can talk about is going to be the nose, um, right? So the nose is here. You can see that the nasal bone is going to be here. Um, we know that it is divided by what we would call is a perpendicular plate or um, the nasal septum. And then what we see here is this bone called the vomer bone. So I'm going to skip and come here. This is the vomer bone. Let's go ahead and erase all of our drawing. Um, this bone right here represents the vomer bone. So what thing do you automatically see that the vomer bone does? Great. If you said it articulates, let's go back. If you said it articulates with this perpendicular plate to create the nasal septum or the nasal septal cartilage, you would be correct. One of the cool things about the vomer bone is in addition to creating the nasal septum, it also becomes like a passageway for a lot of the neurovascular structures within the nasal cavity. So that is its major role. It's a part of the nasal septum. And so the other thing that we can see is it kind of articulates with um, both sides of the, the sphenoid bone. And you can't see it in either of these images, but it also articulates with the ethmoid bone as well.
Okay, as we move on in terms of anatomy, some other things on this image that I guess we should probably talk about just a little bit are going to be the, the maxilla and the mandible. So the maxilla is here. It represents or it creates kind of that inferior medial border of the orbit, right? And so it is this large bone here. It is actually a part of the face. Um, it is a bone of, of mastication. Oftentimes, as we open our mouth, it's going to, um, I guess, move in an upward position to allow the teeth to get in a position to um, move down and crunch or masticate. So it's the mandible or uh, maxilla. This is the maxilla, right? Inferior medial border. It's going to articulate with that zygomatic bone, right? That zygomatic bone, if we recall, is gonna represent the lateral inferior border of that eye orbit. And so it's gonna do that on both sides. Um, this, the maxilla itself is attached to or is associated with one of the 14 um, facial bones. The mandible, however, is like the fibula in the lower limb, right? And when we think about it from a tibial femoral joint perspective, really isn't a part of the knee joint articulation, but it is still a very important bone um, in terms of tibial femoral joint function. Similarly, the, tib, um, the mandible itself is not truly a part of the 14 facial bones, but certainly plays a major role in articulating with the facial bones to allow us to open our mouth, right? To allow us to masticate or eat. And so this is the mandible or what we would call is the, um, the lower jaw um, of the face. So the mandible itself kind of warrants a little bit more um, discussion. And so when we think about the mandible, it's it's made up of a right and a left half that are, are fused together. Um, so they, at birth, they're kind of two bones that eventually become fused together. Um, and so then there are pieces to the mandible that aren't labeled on this structure that I certainly think are extremely important and warrant discussion. So the ramus portion Oh, the ramus portion of the mandible is located here. It's kind of like that widest portion. You have the coronoid process, which is going to articulate, you can see it with the zygomatic bone. But the most important part is going to be this condyle right here. Um, and the articulation of that condyle with the, I don't know if you see it, but with a temporal bone. And we know this joint to be what? Good, you said the temporal mandibular joint, right? So it's the articulation of the mandibular condyle with the temporal bone that creates the, the temporal mandibular joint, right? This part right here represents the body of the mandible. Um, and then in addition to that, we have the angle of the ma mandible, which would be right here. This part right here represents the angle of the mandible. And then we have the ramus, which is going to be right here as labeled. So there are different anatomical structures that are important for you to know about the mandible as we kind of move forward. Interestingly enough, the mental nerve moves through the mental foramen, and that mental nerve is responsible for providing sensation to the lower lip. So if you've ever gotten like a numb lower lip, right, um, most often the reason for that lip being numb is going to be the um, paralysis to the actual mental nerve it, itself. All right, your textbook doesn't go into a bunch of detail regarding the anatomy and function or structure and function of the face muscles, but some of these face muscles are important to note. So I'm going to start probably out of order of this list, but the first set of muscles that I'm going to talk about are the obicularii. Um, oculi muscles. And so these would be number five and six represented on this particular image. What do you think they do? Great. If you said they close the eyelids, then you would be correct, right? Their major role when they can contract is to a uh, number five, the obicularis oculi, the superior portion. Its major role is to draw the superior eyelid down. And then number six, the obicularis oculi uh, lateral, its major role would be to bring that lower eyelid up, right? And so you get eye closure, either they force eyes, eye close when there is exposure to some foreign object, or they lightly allow the lids to be closed. Uh, for example, when you are actually uh, sleeping. The next muscle that I want to discuss is muscle number two, which is the corrugator super super silly. You can see that here. What do you guys think this is for? What do you all think this is for right here? What do you think that muscle does? 
great. If you said it allows you to frown, then you would be correct. So every time I'm talking in class and you guys are like frowning your eyes, like what is Dr. Cosby talking about? Um, you would be using your corrugator super super silly to uh, frown the actual inside of of your eyebrow right the next muscle that i'm going to talk about is the nasalis muscle so that's going to be muscle number seven on this image so this this muscle right here what do you think the nasalis is responsible for how about this De depression of your uh your nasal cavity right so if you've ever like kind of um went to itch your nose and pointed your nose down towards the ground, that would be an example of the function of the nasalis muscle in, in general. The next muscle that I'm going to talk about is the orbicularis oris, which is going to represent number 12 on this particular graph. So number 12, the orbicularis oris is right here. And what do you think its major role is? Well, if you're able to kiss someone, um, you would blame your orbicularis or your orbicularis or its major role is to cause the lips to close and to allow us to pucker up for a kiss. Um, just food for thought. The uh, next muscle we'll talk about is the, the bustinator muscle. The bustinator muscle is going to be number 13 on here. So it's, it's this little muscle right here. The bussinator muscle, its major role is to compress the cheeks against the uh, teeth. So have you ever had something sour and you bring your cheeks towards your teeth? Um, that's one thing to think about. Very useful in mastication. But how many of you all can whistle? If you can whistle relatively well, you're bringing your cheeks towards your teeth to pucker your lips. So in essence, you're using your bussinator muscle to bring those cheeks in towards your teeth so you can actually whistle. I mean, hey, I don't know if you're getting excited, but I get excited knowing these things about the human body, right? Um, the next muscle that I'm going to talk about, let's see if it's actually on here, is the depressor anguli oris, which is going to be number 16. And so it's this, it's this muscle right here. So number 16, the depressor anguli oris. And its major role um, in terms of what it does is when it's contracted, it's going to depress the angle of the mouth. And so it's going to allow us to do what? What do you think? To frown, right? To frown our lips. Have you ever like turned your lips down? So if you've ever turned your lips down, then the reason you can do that, the, re the reason you can make that face is because of that depressor anguli, right? Oris. The opposite of that muscle is number nine. It's going to be the, um, no, where are you? Levator anguli oris. Oh man, I don't see it on there. But the levator anguli oris is going to be uh, majorly important for doing the opposite of what we just talked about, the depressor anguli oris. So what do you think it's going to do? It's going to elevate the angle of the mouth and guess what it's going to do? it's gonna cause a little bit of a smile, if that makes sense. And I think that is going to be, we're gonna call that number eight, cause that looks like the right angle. And then the num number nine, those two are gonna be responsible for allowing us to, to smile a little tiny bit. And then the last muscle that I think I'm gonna talk about um, is the uh, frontalis. What do you think the frontalis muscle does? So number one, what do you think it does? Anyone wanna tell me? Anyone? Any guesses? Okay, so if we think about the frontalis, um, the major thing that it does is it allows us to raise our eyebrows. So if we're like have that surprise look, right? Oftentimes like, oh my gosh, I'm going to widen my eyes. One of the major muscles responsible for allowing you to do that is the frontalis muscle. So you can see how Many of these muscles play a role in um, mastication. Another example of that would be the masseter muscle. Um, the masseter muscle, its major role is going to be in assisting several different muscles on here. So the, the masseter, the lateral pythagoroid, the medial pythagoroid, and the temporalis muscle, all of those muscles are what we call our muscles of mastication. So they are major muscles in allowing us to break up food, allowing us to chew, and making it more palatable for us to digest overall. 
So in general, these are the muscles of the face. You need to know the ones that I mentioned because they become important when you're thinking about facial paralysis and understanding which muscles aren't working. So when we have our patients smile versus frown versus create blow or um, pucker up to, to, have, to make a kiss, right? Those are all important things that we as athletic trainers need to know. So now we're moving on to pathologies. The most commonly fractured bone of the face and skull um, are going to be the, the nasal bones. Um, believe it or not, the it is the third most commonly fractured bone in the entire body as a result of direct fracture. So being able to assess um, fractures of the nasal cavity are extremely important. Uh, what we know about nasal fractures is they most often happen as a result of some type of direct trauma to the patient. So that's going to be the mechanism of injury. And anytime we have a nasal pathology, we always want to assess and evaluate for a concussion. One key sign and symptom that we want to look out for when we're thinking about a skull fracture is whether or not the patient has raccoon eyes, right? So if they take a direct blow to the nose without hitting the orbital areas and they start to have ecchymosis bilaterally on both in both eye orbits, that would be a sign and a symptom of not only a nasal fracture, but then potentially a skull fracture as well. So what questions are we thinking that we're asking as we're looking at this patient who's presenting to us with a bloody nose? Uh, the first thing is whether or not they have ecchymosis, right? So do they have ecchymosis, redness, blueness in the nasal area? Again, does it move out into the orbital area and do we need to rule out an actual nasal fracture? Whether or not the uh, the nose is symmetrical, right? Um, I'm not sure if you all have seen a nasal fracture yet, but sometimes you can have a deviation to one side or another. And so then that becomes concerned because as we talked about, remember, if we were to go back a few slides, we look at the nasal cavity and we would see, right, that vomer bone is going to make up the nasal septum. So if it becomes, if it becomes separated, let's go back one more slide. If it becomes separated from that perpendicular plate, right, right in here, then what we can oftentimes see is a deviation to one side or the other. So the question that I'm asking you all to look for when we're looking at nasal fractures is whether or not we have a symmetrical fracture, in other words, the nose is aligned, or whether or not there's actually a malalignment, right? So we know that athletes who complete, who compete in uh, what we call our contact sports are going to be at highest, highest risk for a nasal fracture. Um, but bleeding is typically the chief complaint of a patient with a, a nasal pathology. On, the, on inspection, what we really want to look for is whether or not there's deformity. But we have to make sure that we aren't just using deformity as our telltale sign for a fracture because a lack of deformity does not conclusively rule out a nasal fracture, right? We want to look for swelling in and around the nasal area. Um, we also want to look at um, ecchymosis that develops. And keep in mind, the ecchymosis and those raccoon eyes may not develop because blood needs to pull to the cavities. So it may take 24 hours or so for blood to or ecchymosis to actually present itself. We think about palpation. What things are we expecting that we might see with a nasal fracture? Well, certainly tenderness to palpation, right? Um, at the fracture site, crepitus, which is like that creakiness, may be identifiable, particularly if we see um, disruption of the vomer um, bone. So what we want to do is oftentimes we want to look in the nasal cavity with some sort of pin light to see if we actually have alignment, to see if we actually have some type of septal hematoma. And what is a septal hematoma? Well, hopefully you said that the nose is rich in blood supply, right? Lots of capillaries, arteries, and veins. So oftentimes when we have a direct blow to the nose, a septal hematoma can form, which means kind of a bruise or a pulling of blood within the actual skin of the nose. And you can kind of see that down here in this image, and it may block your ability to actually see through each of the nasal pathways, right? So how do we um, treat a nose injury? Um, first, we wanna stop the bleeding. If it's fractured, we certainly don't want to insert something in there. So oftentimes, if you apply an ice pack, which will cause vasoconstriction and slow the bleeding down, you can put pressure just beneath the nose on the upper portion of the maxilla. But again, we want to check for, for that deformity. If we suspect a fracture or a deviated septum or a septal hematoma is suspected, then we automatically refer out anytime we have displaced fractures. 
we want to refer out so that it can be a realigned the recommendation is never to reduce it or to realign it to actually allow a professional to do that other concerns would be if a patient is choking for example um, because maybe the blood is leaking into the um, throat cavity then that warrants referral as well well, here are some ex prime examples of fractures, right? This would be a displaced fracture. You can see that here, nasal uh, septum is probably disrupted. This would be what we call is a flat fracture where the direct blow actually caused the fracturing of that vomer plate. And so the nose is sitting in a flat position. Oftentimes this is gonna disrupt the respiratory pathway and inhibit breathing. And then now you have a nasal fracture with a displaced fracture and then also bleeding. So each of these are just different different instances in which you see um, displacements or different types of fractures. When you have a displaced fracture, one of the concerns is that in the direction of the displacement, the patient may have more difficulty breathing on that side, may complain of a stuffy nose. So again, just refer out if you are unsure. So if the patient is going is bleeding um, and if they have no history of an acute injury, we can just put a cotton plug in it, right, or a gauze. So if they have spontaneous no nosebleeds. Now, um, the recommendation for play is that these would have to be cut a little bit shorter, if that makes sense, so that you're, there isn't potential to have it poked even further. So we would cut the nasal plugs and then just pull them out when we're done. That will create um, an actual hematoma and stop the bleeding eventually. But if there are actual fractures, right, and we suspect a fracture, then we have to examine for deformity. We need to look at the different views, so a superior view, a frontal view. We'll have the athlete fill and look for deformity as well because they will know what's normal. And then we want to ice, uh, position for drainage. In, in fact, we typically don't put the head back when they're bleeding. We actually position that head forward. We'll press on that maxilla. Um, if there's no pain and there's no maxillo fracture, and then we're referring out. What we know for most nasal fractures is ice and pain is um, ice is going to work for pain control. And then sometimes, depending on whether or not they have that nasal deviation, we can give them decongestants because they're going to be very stuffy. And then um, we're going to refer to an ear, nose, and throat practitioner if the spontaneous nose bleeding doesn't go away. Um, if the decon or the decongestants don't work and they're ha still having issues breathing. So evaluating a fractured nose, what are some ways to kind of do that? Um, what we're talking about in the hospital setting, obviously you will not be anesthetizing anything unless of course you become a physician. But essentially what they'll do is they'll do an x-ray um, or they'll go in to look at the septum. So they'll go in orthoscopically through the nasal cavity and look at the nasal septum to see if in fact there is a fracture. See that fulmar bone here. And if there's a fracture, what they'll do is anesthetize first and then they'll go ahead and reset um, that fracture. Sometimes they'll do it without visibility. In other words, without an actual camera um, to see the fracture. And then most often, if it's an ears, nose, and throat doctor, they'll go in with the scope with a scope to visualize to make sure all the bones are aligned the way that they're supposed to. Oftentimes, if you've ever seen a fractured nose and you see that little bump there, it's usually because the fracture wasn't reset properly um, or the patient didn't get referred out and so the bones set in in a fractured position and kind of started to um, ostracize and heal in that particular position all right everyone we're going to start by talking about the evaluation of the ear and um, a key thing to note if i don't say this in the next few slides is any disruption in hearing that's greater than an hour warrants referral the great thing about ear injuries is we typically only see them in like really designated sports. So boxing is, is one of those. Ice hockey is another. Wrestling is probably the sport where uh, ear, ear injuries, ear infections, ear pathologies happen most. Um, and so we won't see them very often. If we do, we're actually going to see them as it relates to disease or illness. And so we'll talk through that a little bit. But our first step, of course, is going to be the anatomy of the ear. As we think through the anatomy of the ear, I would really like us to break the anatomy of the ear into kind of three different kind of components. Um, the first part is going to be the um, what we call is the outer ear. Um, the outer ear kind of ends right about there. Um, then uh, next, we're going to look at the middle ear. 
the middle ear is going to end right about here on this image and then we have the inner ear which is going to end right about here and we'll talk through each of those because you know no true anatomical image is uh truly accurate but understanding the parts of the ear and the role of each part of the process in creating sound and allowing us to hear is going to be extremely important so that outer ear is composed of the auricle right here or some people would call it the penna um, the auricle is majorly important for grabbing or collecting sound waves from the external environment and then pulling them into what we call is the external auditory canal. So those sound waves hit the inner portion of the auricle. They then travel through this external auditory canal or audit auditory meatus and the sound gets amplified. Um, as that sound gets amplified, it's going to travel to this flexible oval anatomical structure known as the tympanic membrane. And what happens here is that tympanic membrane will start to vibrate. It'll start to vibrate and it will cause the bones um, of the middle ear, right? So we're going to have the mali, malleus, the incus, and the stapes. It's going to cause all of them to oscillate um, and, and vibrate. And when it does that, what we know about this is that the these bones attach to the um, the oval window known as the uh, semicircular semicircular canal in the inner ear. Um, the semicircular canal is going to then send those impulses to the cochlea or the snail shaped organ. Um, and then that cochlea is filled with fluid and it moves in response to these vibrations, right? So just think we have this sound coming from the external environment. It moves through this external auditory canal. It causes the vibration of this flexible window. This flexible window then causes the vibration of these small um, middle ear bones. Those middle ear bones begin to oscillate. Those uh, vibrations then get sent through the semicircular canal. Um, to the cochlea and then when the cochlea when the vibrations hit the cochlea it causes the movement of a fluid right and that fluid um, as that fluid moves through the cochlea you have about twenty five thousand nerve endings that are set into motion and these nerve endings um, they're responsible for doing what transforming those vibrations into electrical impulses that um, then travel along the auditory nerve or the eighth cranial nerve to the brain right and then that's where the brain interprets those signals so that's how sound really moves through each of the um, different um, ear divisions to actually reach the brain to be interpreted as sound, whether that's loud sound, whether that's high pitch, low pitch, whether that's dull pitch, whatever it is, that's how that process of sound actually occurs. So we can see that better kind of in this image here. Again, we have the, the oracle, which is going to pick up sound and bring that sound through the ear canal. It's going to cause the, the vibration right of the tympanic membrane. What we can see probably more beautiful here is we have the malleus taking up the brunt of the vibration, sending that to the incus and then to the stapes, which um, has a direct attachment to the, the semicircular canals, right? Semicircular canals will then take those vibrations, um, send them through the cochlea and start the movement of fluid, right? And so once we have the movement of fluid, the fluid then stimulates those 25,000 nerve endings to kind of uh, send electrical impulses through the auditory nerve to the brain, at which point in time that is then interpreted as sound, right? Now, one thing that we're looking at in this image, we're kind of moving into pathologies just a tad bit. We have several different type of pathologies that um, will plague our patients that really don't have anything to do with injury. We have otitis externa, which is going to be inflammation of the outer ear. Uh, and then we have otitis media, which is going to be inflammation of what? The, the, the middle ear, right? And so we can kind of define those and then talk through those just a little bit. Um, with otitis externa, as I said, that's going to be um, an uh, inflammation or infection of the external ear. It can also be an infection of the external auditory canal. So uh, most often we see this in like swimmers, swimmers ear, or in patients who use Q-tips too much. You can irritate this pathway and cause an inflammation. 
And then for middle ear, we typically see this uh, most often in babies, but it certainly can happen in college age students as well. Um, and so we have this thing called the eustachian tube, which is here. Oftentimes what we see um, is the eardrum is connected to the throat by the eustachian tube. And so either you can have fluid backing up from the throat into the middle ear, um, or you can have fluid in the middle ear that back that goes into the throat and causes a respiratory infection so we can see how the ears eyes nose and throat would be connected in this scenario all right our first stop is external ear injuries um, and the first is going to be an auricular hematoma as the name implies it is a hematoma to the external portion of the ear in particular the the oracle of the ear most often we call that cauliflower ear and i think i have an image of that on the next slide so this would be cauliflower ear in which sport do you think we would see this most often you can see kind of the inflammation pulling in between the skin and the cartilage of the ear in which sports do you think we would see this most often great if you said most often you would see that in wrestling as the ear rubs against the mat or boxing then you would be correct those are the two most common sports that we see this in the mechanism of injury is going to be repeated trauma either repeated rubbing from the mat or re repeated direct blows um, in terms of the pathology what we see is blood accumulates between that very thin surface of the skin and the actual cartilage um, and so you get a tearing of the uh, vascular structures and blood pulling underneath the skin. What we see oftentimes, at least in wrestling, is that when it becomes chronic, um, it becomes granulation tissue and scar tissue and becomes very, very, very hard. So oftentimes, if it's the first insult of injury, we do nothing. We kind of, I've seen in the clinical setting where we create what we call our auricular cast to apply pressure. Um, but then what I've also seen, if there are repeat offenders, oftentimes the physician will go in and drain an, oh my goodness, it is one of the most painful things to watch because you just imagine you're going right into the ear with a, a needle and draining blood from the auricular re uh, region. So it's not a fun type of surgery. I've also seen physicians cre um, actually take a scalpel and just create little slits in the area to drain. And then again, like I said, they'll create like a plaster cast over that ear and the athlete will wear that for a few days to create pressure um, to uh, reduce the amount of fluid in the ear. So as I mentioned before, the next pathology that we might see is otitis externa, uh, aka swimmer's ear. Please, for the purpose of your exam, know it as otitis externa. Um, but this is a bacterial infection. Most often that occurs from excessive exposure to uh, water, in particular water where lots of bodies have been swimming. Um, so that's why we call it swimmer's ear because most often it occurs from being in the pool too often. So it's an outer ear infection, as I mentioned earlier, um, and it typically occurs within the um, external auditory meatus. So within that actual canal, it doesn't typically touch the tymp tympanic membrane itself. It may occur with cauliflower ear, in other words, the ear can get so large, the fluid could just start backing up that it pushes into that canal and causes an otita externa, but it is secondary to that. The most common cause is going to be a bacterial infection. A positive sign and symptom is actually just to tug on the ear and see if that increases pain. That would be a positive test for otita externa. Next is otita media. Otitis media uh, most often occurs as a result of an upper respiratory tract infection. Remember, I talked about that eustachian tube having um, a direct connection to the throat. So oftentimes, if you have an upper respiratory tract infection, that infection can actually back up into the, the middle ear and cause irritation and inflammation um, or an infection. So you see otitis media, if not in infants, in patients with a history of upper respiratory tract infections. And we can do what we call is a positive Weber's test. So we can actually like rub our fingers by the patient's ears and um, the vibration will be increased in that particular area. In other words, they'll hear the sounds a little bit more because there's more fluid on that side. So oftentimes the treatment is going to be antibiotics um, and you'll do a very short dose of that to cure this. So if your patient presents to you with otitis media, that's a referral out to get some antibiotics most often because it's caused by some sort of a bacterial infection often associated with an upper respiratory tract illness. So if we take a look at this image and we know how sound is processed, remember we talked about 
that um, inkies, mollies, and stapes, remember we talked about how they cause vibration and then you have st uh, stimulation of the semicircular canals and then that um, facilitates fluid to move and that's what kind of converts um, sound waves into electrical impulses. So we can imagine that if we have increased fluid within that middle ear, that when we use that Weber's test where we are rubbing our fingers together and if they hear that more on the injured side, it would make sense because they're moving fluid, which would facil facilitate or activate, right, those thousands of, of nerves that are sitting, neurons that are sitting there. So that is an example of why a positive why the patient would have a positive Weber's test, and we will do that in lab. So here would be the clinical presentation, and here's where I get excited because we're going to be using the otoscope in lab. Um, so this is a tympanic membrane, and remember the tympanic membrane is like the window between the external ear and the middle ear, right? Um, so this would be a healthy tympanic membrane. It's white. Um, you can't really see many structures. Then if you have a middle ear infection where the fluid is allowed to build up, you will start to see um, fluid, dark fluid potentially in the window. And then you might start to see a little bit of a bulge um, outward into the external canal. So as we move into the ear with the otoscope, we have to be very careful that we don't rupture um, your partner's tympanic membrane, no pressure. So I guess it would make sense that we would talk about a tympanic membrane rupture as we're talking about otitis media because if the fluid is allowed to build up, the only way that the tympanic membrane can um, continue to stretch is externally. And so eventually, if we don't care for otitis media, it can actually cause a tympanic membrane rupture. Now, there are other ways that the tympanic membrane can be ruptured. Blunt trauma, a direct blow to the external canal where the vibrate, vibratory forces are so great that it causes the tympanic membrane to rupture. Or again, you can have that um, otitis media or an inner ear infection with increased fluid that may um, increase the pressure on the tympanic membrane, thereby causing a rupturing. Uh, the other way that we see, and probably the most common way that we see tympanic membranes get ruptured is pressure um, during travel. So many of you need your ears to pop when you're traveling. Think of it that way. So what do we want to do with a ruptured tympanic membrane? For the most part, they can resolve themselves, but we have to avoid water. So avoid submerging the ear in water because what will happen? Water will leak through, get into the inner ear, and create um, balance uh, pathologies. So do not use a Q-tip, and then we want to refer out. Most often, uh, the signs and symptoms will be uh, the patient will complain of like some type of whistling per se or hissing because there's a hole between the external ear and the middle ear. So they'll complain of some type of whistling. We can also see here in this image that you can rupture your own tympanic membrane if you're using a Q-tip. So be very, very careful as you're doing this. In fact, Q-tips aren't really recommended to clean ears these days. There are other things that you can use such as hydrogen peroxide, just soap and water with a um, um, piece of tissue on the tip of your finger, lots of ways to avoid kind of trauma to the tympanic membrane. So we are moving on to the throat. And as we consider the throat, um, the biggest thing to consider is that any trauma to the throat will re result in respiratory distress. It will may result in your patient in the inability of the patient to speak, which means your patient may get frustrated and may also faint in front of you if they can't move air. So keep those things in mind as you walk up to a patient who has had or received throat trauma. All right, so as we think about the throat, most of the trauma to the throat is going to be blunt force trauma, contusion-like, so a direct blow, a karate chop if you're frustrated with someone, right? Have to insert some humor into this online lecture. Um, but most of the time, it's really going to be blunt force trauma, so a direct blow to the anterior aspect of the throat. Um, most serious conditions we're going to refer out. So if the patient has the inability to catch their breath, for example, if a patient is, has the inability to speak or if they become more agitated, we're going to refer those out, right? So that compromised, um, that compromised respiration, for example, anytime they're wheezing, right, which indicates a closing of the actual airway or obstruction of the airway, or if they have per swelling, right, within the throat muscles, then the biggest concern would be we have to refer them out or if the muscles are spasming so much that it's closing off the airway. That would be another example of why we would actually need to refer that particular patient out um, to receive more care.
So your textbook really doesn't do a whole bunch of throat anatomy, but I think it's important for you guys to understand essentially what happens, what's the progress of the throat, how, what anatomical structures are connected to the throat, what blood flow is in front of the throat. So I'm going to start on the left-hand side of the slide and we're going to look at structures. The first one's going to be the internal jugular vein, and then we're going to um, identify the structure right here, which is going to be the carotid artery. Oftentimes, um, blows to the throat in the superior lateral region will actually have an impact on the carotid artery, creating um, an immediate, usually a referral out, sometimes warranting, um, believe it or not, uh, the call to 911 if blood flow is now compromised to, to the rest of the brain. We can also look at the this structure here, which is going to be the larynx or the voice box. We have the trachea, which is a position there. And then we have this anatomical structure right here, which is our thyroid. A lot of times when we're palpating the throat, we want to fill for the thyroid and make sure that it's not enlarged. So at minimum, if we're looking at this at face value, the trachea can become injured or compromised. The larynx can become um, compromised as well. And then any of these vascular structures, particularly the internal jugular brain, vein, which is going to be very superficial, and then the, um, the carotid artery. Now, this small little nerve right here is the vagus nerve. So oftentimes, if that gets compromised, what is our natural reflex? What do you think? Yeah, you got it right to gag, right? Now, on this side of the slide, on this right-hand side of the slide, we have the anatomy of the upper airway. So we have that nasal passage. And remember, we talked about those concha or turbinae. Remember, their major role is to do what? To take the air that we breathe through the nasal pathway and to warm it um, before it actually enters into the upper portion of the respiratory pathway or, or the pharynx, right? We also have the oral passage or oral pharyngeal airway, right? So we have air entering into the mouth. We have air entering into the nose. Both of those systems will kind of come together to dump air into the pharynx, right? We have this small anatomical structure right here known as the epiglottis, it's a flap. And so um, the beautiful thing about this flap is, depending on where we want things to go, if we want air to move, the flap will open and we air will move down into the trachea. However, if we want food to move, then what we do is that that flap will cover kind of the trachea larynx and allow food to move into the esophagus, right, where then it's digested and broken down um, and then defecated, right? So we have the pharynx here. We have air then moving through the, the epiglottis to the larynx and then through the trachea where it's then distributed. So we can have injury to any of these anatomical structures to the larynx, to the trachea, um, posteriorly, typically we don't have injury to the pharynx um, and definitely usually typically don't have injury to the esophagus. However, any compromise to the muscle surrounding the neck, right? And you certainly could see a spasming, which could cause it have implications for the trachea and the larynx as well. Here is a muscular view of the muscles that kind of help control um, the neck. You, I will highlight some of the common ones for an, um, for AT that are going to be important. This is going to represent the clavicular portion of the sternocleidomastoid. This is going to represent the clav um, the clavicular portion of the sternocleidomastoid. So you can see their relationship to um, the neck. And so um, any any injury or crush trauma, and you have smaller intricate muscles such as the sternohyoid muscle, um, the omohyoid muscle, all are major muscles in um, mastication, in kind of moving this bone here, the hyoid bone out of the way. Um, and so they become important because these are all muscles that will spasm. The scaly muscles, which are muscles for breathing, um, these all these muscles can all become traumatized and impact the the airway, right? And that's extremely, extremely important. And so that's the reason for showing this image here. So the common uh, pathologies of the airway are going to be laryngitis, tonsillitis, and pharyngitis. Um, they are all, as the names imply, inflammatory responses or infections. You can have an infection to the larynx, you can have uh, tonsillitis, which all of us are aware of, and you can have an, an inflammation or an infection of, of the pharynx itself. Uh, it can be bacterial and or viral. Both are associated with an upper respiratory tract infection. It's just a matter of if we're treating that with back with some type of antibiotic and or just allowing it to run its course. 
um, the referral in terms of whether or not the patient presents with any of these pathologies would be they have a sore throat and a fever and maybe even on palpation in the in the upper portion of the lateral neck they have swollen lymph nodes right um, if that is the case then we refer out typically what um, most physicians will do is a strep in this day and age we're dealing with covid and rsv right so they'll also do, in addition to a strep test, they'll do a COVID test, a rapid flu test, um, and an array of, of different tests to ensure that the patient isn't going to infect anyone that they might be around. So the major role of the larynx, so when we think about it, if the larynx becomes traumatized, its major role, the voice box, right, when eating is it elevates um, and the and uh, the allows the esophagus to open to allow food to progress through for digestion, right? So any compromise to the larynx and we might lose the ability of it to elevate, which may slow down the rate at which food is allowed to move through the esophagus. And so we want to, if we have throat trauma, um, we want to monitor the vitals. And what we really want to look for is, do they have painful breathing? Do they have cessation of breathing or no breathing at all? Um, how are they doing with their uh, just breathing in general? Do we have swelling that is starting to increase within the throat? And then if so, we're going to be, if any of these things happen, we're referring right away to a level one trauma center, right? Because we're concerned about what? We're concerned about the airway actually closing off. And in this case, patients might actually need supplemental oxygen if in fact the airway is clear, but they are struggling to breathe because they won't be breathing in enough oxygen to sustain a life. So what we know about head trauma in general, throat trauma, is that if it's blunt force trauma and it's enough to actually cause injury to the face and or the head, then we may have to C-spine that patient or cervical board spine that patient. Um, so we have to look, when we think about throat, depending on the type of blow, we also have to consider the head and the face and whether or not we should be collaring that patient. Um, if it's a whiplash patient, for example, and we want to reduce the spasming of the muscles about the neck, we want to make sure that we see collar them so we're lessening the need for the muscles to contract. All in all, anytime we have issues with breathing to the airway, it is an automatic referral when we're talking about neck pathologies. Next is our mouth. Um, I always think it's important to understand our anatomy. I've said that multiple times. So the top part, this part right here is called Cupid's bow. Isn't that cute? Cupid shooting an arrow. Um, the philtrum is that kind of divot at the top part of the mouth. And so we have what are called lower and upper vermilion borders. And so you can see those there. And then the closing of the mouth in these two pieces right here are called oral commissures. So we can see that this is mouth anatomy. And then within the mouth, you see that? We have these commissures, which um, are tubercles, which allow the mouth to pucker with the bustinator muscle, allow the mouth to pucker to make a kind of a kissing component or to stretch and to frown. Now, as we look at teeth anatomy, it's important that you're using the correct terms to define teeth. Um, so we're looking at the posterior part of the mouth moving back, right? Looking at the posterior part of the mouth and moving back. And so what we can see are the molars and you, you should technically um, name them, right? Obviously with the third being the furthest back, if that makes sense. Um, and so then you have your incisors, which are huge for what? Eating, breaking down food, breaking it down into smaller pieces. You have your canines, which are going to be located here. But your teeth in general, what are they mainly responsible for? Mastication, right? That's their major role. Mastication, chewing things, breaking things down. Um, injury to your tooth can have implications for not only the mouth, but can also have implications for the throat. We know that the throat is connected to the ears, eyes, nose, and throat, and so it can have implications for everything that we've been talking about. So it's important to have proper hygiene and to care for our mouth. So mandibular fractures are the second most common type of facial fracture ranking <laughs> just behind nasal fractures um, because they result um, from high velocity impact to the jaw. So boxing, MMA, um, high risk sports. The chief complaint most often with the mandibular uh, fracture is going to be pain in the jaw that is going to be increased with opening and closing of the mouth. But the mechanism of injury most often is going to be acute blunt force trauma. So a direct blow to the, the mandible causing it to fracture in a sweet spot. 
in addition to some of the signs and symptoms, they're going to have difficulty. The biggest difficulty that they're going to have um, is just anything that would cause movement. In addition to that, with the mandibular fracture, most oftentimes you'll feel kind of uh, crepitus, maybe felt when you're palpating the fracture site. And then what we know about mandibular fractures most often is oftentimes they uh, result in what we call is a malocclusion of the jaw and the teeth. Um, and so in other words, let me say it this way, a malalignment of the jaw and the, the teeth. And so we'll do what we call is a positive tongue blade test. So this tongue blade test has a really high uh, sensitivity, which means what? If the test is negative, then we know that, that we don't have a fracture. Essentially what we do, and we'll do this in lab, is you're going to apply a, um, a tongue depressor on one side or the other of the two teeth, upper and lower teeth, and then you're going to fr try to break that um, that tongue depressor. And if you're allowed to break it, then that's a negative test. In other words, if they have a mandibular fracture, remember the mandible, once you open the mouth, it, when you when you move it, you're gonna have increased pain. So fracturing or breaking of that tongue blade will cause, will cause pain in a patient who has a fracture. But again, it's used to actually rule out a fracture, which means if they don't have pain with this test, you can be pretty certain that they actually don't have a fracture of the mandible. There are common sites for, for fractures. Most of them are really have to do with kind of where the bone is changing its shape, which uh, I think makes the most sense and is pretty intuitive. So one fracture site is actually the body. The other is at the, the symphysis where the two bones actually come together and fuse. Remember, they're one. Um, and then you can also have a fracture to the uh, the condyle, which will cause TMJ uh, pathologies. And then there are other types of fractures, but most common to the body and to the symphysis. Those are the areas of, um, I guess, most exposure or common sites of impact for mandibular fractures. Next, we have a zygomatic fracture. Uh, the mechanism of injury is often going to be a direct blow to the cheek or the kind of inferior periorbital -or area, which may result in a fracture of the zygoma um, on that particular side, um, especially at the arch, because that's where it's going to actually be, be changing its, its shape. Um, most often, these can result in displaced fractures, which, which can re result in malalignment of the two eyes. But typically, when you have a zygomatic fracture, the patient is going to have pain with eye movement. Um, and part of that is, remember, the zygomatic, uh, the zygomatic bone creates, is responsible for, help, for helping create the, what, um, you guys tell me, the inferior border, right, of the orbit. And so oftentimes when the, the eye tries to move into an inferior direction and even a superior direction, you might actually have pain with, with eye movement. In addition to that, you can get what we call is a subconjunctival hematoma, right? So remember, we talked about this in the eye pathology where you have lots of capillaries within the conjunctiva. So you can have a bleeding that occurs from the trauma of it all, particularly in the lower subconjunctival sub area. Bleh. You're going to have a patient who presents to you with a raccoon eye, which again, that could be a sign and symptom of a major head injury. And then you could also have a step off deformity as you're palpating in the in the inferior orbit because remember that zygomatic bone, what does it attach to? Anybody remember? Someone tell me. Good. If you said the maxilla, then you would be correct, right? Um, so you might have a step off where the, the maxilla um, and the uh, zygo zygoma bone um, attach, right? So you can have a step off deformity. Okay, um, next we're going to talk about maxillary fractures. Um, they are fractures that tend to occur concurrently with nasal fractures. Um, and this is a perfect image to depict that. So you have the nasal cavity here and then you have the maxilla here. So oftentimes when you have a nasal fracture, you might actually fracture a piece or a part of the actual maxilla most often it's going to be the kind of most superior portion of that maxilla but you certainly can have other maxillary fractures and we'll talk about those in just a second those are called lafort fractures but that superior part of the maxilla can certainly concurrently be fractured off um, during a nasal fracture so you want to assess the maxilla, ma maxilla bone as well 
Deformities are uh, very rare with a true maxilla fracture. And then most often you'll see a black eye because the maxilla makes up what? The inferior orbit of the eye. But what I really want to talk about are Lefort fractures. Um, and his name, Lefort, is a system that is used to kind of classify mid-face fractures. So we're going to say mid-face fractures. And this was actually on the board of certification examination not too long ago. So it's an important classification system system to, to talk through. Even though it's rare in athletics, I still want to spend time talking through this. We see this most often in car accidents where maybe the airbag will deploy and cause a front, front facial fracture. Um, what we want to do if we have a patient with a Lefort fracture is literally control the bleeding, establish airway, and then call 911 as soon as possible. As I mentioned, this Lefort fracture is a system that is going to be used to classify mid-face fractures. Um, and again, because they are so rare and occur from high impact, so we're talking like automobile accidents, for example, they are unusual in athletics, but I still want to prepare you for that. Um, so this type of fracture is so extensive that um, when the upper teeth are pulled are pulled forward. Let's think about it this way. When the upper teeth are pulled forward. So if you were to put your fingers but um, the posterior side of your upper teeth or the maxilla, when you pull that forward, you will feel the segment of the face move forward as well. There are three different types of Lefort fractures. Um, Lefort fracture one, I don't know if you can see it there, but it is going to involve this portion of the face. So hopefully you all can see that very well in the image. So in a type one, essentially what we have happening is an, a horizontal fracture. You can see that there, and it's gonna separate the teeth. You can see that here from the upper face, right? So I'm gonna erase my strokes just so you can see that clear. In a Lefort type one, we have a horizontal fracture, and you can see that the teeth are separated from the upper face, right? The next type of Lefort fracture is a Lefort fracture part two. I'll highlight that in blue. So it's this right here. In a Lefort fracture type two, it's called a pyramidal fracture because it looks almost like a pyramid. Um, what you essentially get with a Lefort fracture type two um, is the teeth are at the uh, base of the pyramid, and then you have some sort of nasal suture kind of frontal fracture. Um, the fracture itself, it passes through the lateral walls of the maxillary sinuses, so you can see that there. Um, and so the biggest concern with this is it's going to involve more of the actual face itself. And then with a Lefort fracture type three, I'll highlight that there. Um, with the Lefort fracture type three, this is kind of a cranial facial disjunction, right? So you have a separation between the cranial bones and the facial bones. It's a transverse fracture line, which passes through nasal frontal, maxillofrontal, orbital wall, zag zygomatic arch. Um, and so because of its involvement with the zygomatic arch, um, there is risk of impinging some of the muscles of the, the cranium, right? Um, unsurprisingly, I guess, you know that because it's going to involve create the cranium that um, oftentimes this is associated with some sort of like cerebral spinal fluid leak. So as a memory aid, the way that I kind of like to think about these, if I had to remember kind of what is involved, the Lefort is a, fro a floating palate, a horizontal fracture. Lefort 2 is going to be that per pyramidal um, the maxilla is moving completely. And then Lefort uh, 3, think about it this way, the, the face is floating or moving. It's not the maxilla itself. So hopefully that's helpful. Anytime you witness a fracture of this sort or of this, of this type, it, it is absolutely a medical emergency. Again, um, you can do an, what we call as an anterior drawer test and we'll do that in class. So we're going to be talking about uh, the TMJ or tip, tip, temporal mandibular joint and we'll kind of start here and we'll just talk about a sprain or a fracture to this particular joint. Um, remember it's where the temporal bone and the mandibular bone come together where the art, uh, the condyle of the mandible will articulate with the temporal bone. Etiology is most often a lateral blow to the mandible um, but certainly could be a posterior blow as well and so essentially what you have um, is malalignment of the teeth but mainly it's the lower jaw, right? Because now that 
mandible is allowed to slide or glide more than it normally does. You can have some type of stretching or strain to the temporalis um, or a spasming of the masseter muscles. Um, but either way, uh, essentially what we're concerned with is does that malalignment create kind of a clicking or a popping um, or a malalignment of the of the mandible? And if so, then you're thinking fracture, right? If there's a malalignment, a teeth deformity, or a palpable pain on the direct manual, we're thinking fracture. But if we get clicking and popping at the actual joint, then what we are thinking is the patient actually has um, just a TM joint sprain or what we call is TMJ syndrome. Uh, if the patient can't put two knuckles in their mouth and hold that, then you're also concerned about a fracture of the TMJ as well. So when we think about management of face injuries, the biggest thing, particularly with the Lefort fractures, is we need to establish an airway, even with the throat, right? When we have Lefort fractures or really facial injuries in general, we're worried about bleeding. There's lots of uh, arterial, capillary, um, venous blood supply, and so we're worried about bleeding. And then we might want to consider a cervical collar for our neck injuries, uh, for a TMJ fracture or dislocation. And the reason for that is the neck collar will limit the amount of movement that the mandible can actually um, do. All right, this is our final segment of this lecture, injuries to the teeth. Um, just for an anatomy review, we have enamel, which just protects our teeth and most often is the guiding factor to not having pain. We have the dentin of the tooth, um, and then we have the, the pulp of, of the tooth, right? And uh, most often when it gets to the pulp or the root of the tooth, that's where you start to have um, pain. By the time you have pain with a tooth injury, they say it's too late, right? Um, and so the crown of the tooth, this whole entire part um, is extremely important. In fact, when enamel starts to wear away or when we get a cavity, for example, most often we'll either get a feeling it's here that they're working to kind of bring that down just a little bit or they'll cover that with a crown, especially after a root canal, if you have to dead the actual roots um, or the nerves, right, of the teeth. So let's talk through uh, teeth injuries. Teeth injuries are typically, or tooth injuries are typically classified on a scale of one um, to five. Uh, I think I have that on the next slide or not. Okay. Um, so there's, they're classified on a scale of one to five. You can look in your textbook at images 19 through 23 and 1924, and you'll see the different kind of categorizations. Um, but essentially what we're looking at right here are going to be um, kind of root, I guess, uh, what we would call our, our fractures, right? So this A is gonna actually represent class one. Class one is what we would consider to be kind of just a chip fracture, right? Subtly noticed may happen with like eating a chip or something like this. The next one that we have, it's going through, you guys can kind of see that there, it's kind of going through the actual dentin of the tooth. And so we're gonna call that a class three fracture. Um, class three fractures are more easily recognized because there's pain or sensitivity, right? Um, and then you have a class four fracture, which as you all can see is kind of down to the pulp of the tooth. And this is uh, most often going to warrant some type of uh, root canal or some type of root, um, some type of uh, tooth replacement or surgical intervention, right? So we can live with a chipped tooth, right? But most often when we get into the actual dentin or we crack, um, we fracture the enamel and we're in the dentin, then that's when we have severe nerve pain. And so we have to do something to kind of fix that. Most often den dentists in these two phases will create crowns for the tooth. Um, in this case, what they'll do is a root canal most often and then cover that with the crown. Um, and so as we think about tooth injuries, when we have a fracture to the tooth, whether that's a chip or whether that's a complete fracture, sometimes there's bleeding, sometimes there's not, but most often what we see um, is a sensitive tooth, a really hot tooth as most dentists would call it. And so we would have to refer out for that. In other instances, you might have a luxation, which means the tooth may come come out completely. We see this a lot in sports that require mouthpieces and student athletes don't wear them, right? So you wanna hold it by its crown and not by its root, right? Because we don't want to risk infecting the root. Clean with water, milk. Um, saline is not ideal, but you certainly can. 
um, and then you want to uh, store it back in its socket, if that makes sense. If you can put it back in there, it's going to get some of the blood or you can tuck it in the cheek. And the reason for that is think about that something outside of its environment can't thrive, but something in its environment certainly can thrive. And then you're referring immediately out to dentists where they will go in and they will either reinsert the tooth or create a, um, a new tooth for that patient. Whatever you do, don't let it dry because if it dries, then guess what happens? The nerve endings will die. And so if we want to save a tooth, the tooth must be reinserted within 20 minutes to have the best chances of survival. Can you complete with a, compete with a chipped tooth? Absolutely. Does your smile look great? Nope. Um, so as long as it's not loose at the base, right, at its root, then they are okay to continue to participate. Um, if the nerve is compromised, right, so this is pain that does not go away no matter what you do you take pain pills then you refer out probably going to need a root canal the biggest key thing and i hope i'm not reading from the slide but really bringing this to you is make sure you stay away from the er like if it's not traumatic in other words if the throat isn't involved if the face isn't involved or if you don't have a full luxation don't refer to the er they're going to sit there forever send them to a dentist the next day so when managing um, important rules, when managing dental in injuries, I'll let you read this, right? But the biggest thing is to um, store the tooth. If it's a luxated tooth, try to put it in the mouth. We talked about that. Make sure you're not touching the root directly because you can increase um, the risk of infection, right? Um, and then do not sterilize the tooth. Remember that saline thing? Um, so we don't want to actually sterilize it, but again, soak it in that, um, soak it in the water or in the milk and that will save it as well. So I hope this lecture has been helpful. There's lots to cover. Don't worry. We'll get to most of it in class when I see.